Coach Brad here. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about the Chasing Poker Greatness VIP newsletter. Hopping onto the VIP newsletter is the absolute best thing you can do to ensure this plucky little podcast keeps going indefinitely into the future. When you sign up, you'll get exclusive behind the scenes Chasing Poker Greatness content, access to the private Chasing Poker Greatness Slack community, notifications for product launches, entries into monthly free coaching giveaways, and much, much more. So if you're wondering what the absolute best thing you can do to support your favorite poker podcast, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP and access the newsletter today. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP. And now, back to the show. legendary champions next generation stars and tireless ambassadors of the game sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt this is chasing poker greatness with your host brad wilson Welcome, 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 my friend, to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Brad Wilson. And today's guest on the show is one half of the Post Flop Poker podcast hosting duo, Merv Harvey. Despite being an amateur poker player, Merv has interviewed a who's who of poker players and personalities, including Tommy Angelo, Alec Torelli. Sarah Herring, Dara O'Kearney, and many more. The story of how Merv came about hosting Postflop Poker is an extremely important lesson in overcoming your fears and shooting your shot. Merv is just a genuinely great dude who loves the game of poker and is super easy to talk to. In my opinion, the poker world doesn't need more guys snapping and melting down into primordial ooze right in front of the television cameras or their webcams. The poker world needs more folks just like Merv. He's passionate about the game of poker and filled to the brim with such joy that it'll be hard for you to come away from this conversation without a smile on your face. Today, you're going to learn how Merv got swept up in Australia's poker mania, why you've probably been going about poker study the wrong way and what you can do instead, and much, much more. And real quick, before we dive into today's show, If you're looking to level up your poker game and reach a transcendent level of poker play so that you can quickly move up the stakes and skyrocket your win rate, check out PokerWithPresence.com and sign up for the daily email newsletter. One more time, that's PokerWithPresence.com. And now I bring to you the hilarious and joyful Merv Harvey. Merv, welcome to the show, my friend. How you doing? I'm excellent. Thanks, Brad. Uh, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. This is a point where we pretend like we haven't been talking for 30 minutes before we press the record button. How's your day, sir? Oh, my day's been excellent. Uh, to sum it up, I've had a shower and I'm on here. Uh, <laughs> it's about 6.30 in the morning. So. <laughs> you hear that? Uh, nothing like that. Yeah, you hear that, listener? 6.30 in the morning, he's up doing this, so stay glued to the audio. He's making a a giant sacrifice of his (laughs) life force recording this conversation. Uh, It it is something about poker, so, uh, yep, I'm up. (laughs) (laughs) Merv, let's start out at the beginning, and I want to ask you about your story getting into the world of cards. What does that look like? Hmm. Uh, probably my very first recollections of cards is with my great grandmother, uh, playing for matchsticks. And How old are you, by the way? I am five at five. this point. Uh, yep. And I loved, already loved math. No, and I'm in now. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're older than five. That's my read. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, that's, that's pure. Um, 
<laughs> 55, actually. Yeah. Okay. So just, 50, uh, just 50 years ago. 50. Jeez, oh, don't say it like that. <laughs> it makes it sound like it's so long ago. It only feels like yesterday. <laughs> uh, well, you did say matchsticks. So. Yeah. <laughs> true. True, true that. Uh, so, yeah, playing with uh, matches, uh, watching the Manly Ferry go by. It goes by every half hour. Um, another ferry and I just remember ferries all day so we must have been playing for hours and hours and uh yeah for some reason uh, I always loved maths so the the matches were, was a great little learning tool like okay you owe me four here's four um, now another two that's six she probably sent me broke a few times uh but that was the Probably the original time um, I also have this fond memory of playing poker dice at high school. Uh, you know, five dice, ace down to ten. Uh, no, ace down to nines. Been that long since I've seen a, a set. And uh, you'd throw them once, save your, your cards, throw, throw what's left again and then throw what's left again, come out with the best hand. And we used to um, bet for that at school uh, amongst a few other little gambling games. Uh, but my my most fondest memory of the gambling games at school is from the poker dice. And uh, there, Tell was, me about there, it. Was lot of, there was a lot of rich kids at school, let's say that, uh, that had <laughs> had money and some of us didn't. So, uh, so it was kind of a way to uh, make a little bit of a, extra, let's say, cake money and drink money. And, yeah, that was, oh, geez. Yeah, probably one of my, one of my fondest times at that particular school and uh yeah then moved on it was probably should i jump forward another 10 10 or 15 years yeah go for Uh, it (laughs) i had i had all kind of jokes if you you know if you lost too much to your grandma you could just burn the house down with your matchsticks but (laughs) you blew past that i i lost the opportunity Oh, well, that's, that's sad that you lost the opportunity <laughs> for it, but uh, we'll make up for it somehow. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, jumping forward, uh, 2005, probably the same, uh, it was like the Australian version of the moneymaker effect when Joe Hashem won the WSOP in uh, 2005. Watching it on TV, the news story, and just seeing this huge, huge amount of cash. I'd probably, I don't know if I would have ever seen, you know, what was it? 10, 10 million dollars. Uh, eight, it, it's such a huge amount of cash in one place. And I'm like, got this through playing poker. Wow. And it was, then, you know, it, it was very raucous. You know, I remember watching the broadcast and like the Aussie fans were chanting and yelling. And I mean, it was, uh, it was a great atmosphere for Joe and probably, I'm sure it had a, had a major impact in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, I started to see, I mean, I, I don't think they were there before, but I started to see little signs popping up around the place, like, you know, play poker today. Uh, just at little clubs, a uh, few clubs and pubs. Um, tried to get involved in that. And uh, uh, at one stage there was a, a TV ad for a poker game. And I saw that and went, oh, wow, it's even on TV now. They're like, poker here in sydney uh unfortunately that game never never took off uh, they advertised it <laughs> spent the money it never actually got off the ground so yeah so i would i would play just the odd weekend game here and there where at um, um place called harbour diggers uh was one of the first places um Chats is it a car- card room no it's a uh, harbour diggers is a club for ret- well, it started off being a club for returned servicemen, so guys that have come back from the war, yeah, World War One or World War Two, or Vietnam, Korea, probably any of the wars. You I was going to say, how, how old are you coming back from World War One? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luck, luck, luckily, luckily they let us youngins join. Yeah, uh, whether you'd been in in a war or not, uh, but basically that was the, the, the club uh, six o'clock, uh, and they still do now. Six o'clock every day they. Uh, you stop, you face the West and you give a moment's or a minute silence to uh, the diggers that have passed before and, um, yeah, very sort of respectful place. And, uh, yeah, we, we'd uh, have a game. They had a few games on a week, but I could always only ever make uh, the weekends. Um, Did you love reason. it? Did you you fall fell back in love with the game? Oh, totally. Um, it, 
it was the sort of thing I, I had a lot of uh, a lot of things uh, work wise I guess uh, meaning I couldn't play through the week but every every weekend when it would come along you know if I couldn't play I was like oh dang you know like okay I guess it's got to be next weekend and I just you know, put it off and put off the thought of playing and then I'd go and play and then sometimes that uh, joy of playing would only last a couple of hours I remember <laughs> go, when, when, go broke. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I first started playing, these are uh, just twenties, uh, not cash. But um, when I first started playing, you know, if I made the first break, it was like, wow, I'm, I'm I'm doing pretty well. I made the first break, and then I'd make the second break. I think, gee, oh, I'm I must be getting better at this. <laughs> so uh, there was a game early on. Uh, this one was at uh, Chatswood RSL. Uh, again, Return Servicemen's League is the RSL's name. So similar type of club to the Diggers. And um, I think it was about my third or fourth game, and I won it. And uh, I thought, wow, this is this is a pretty easy game. Like you know, I've, I've barely ever played before. So yeah, you, uh, you you can play like Joe. No big deal. Easy game. Easy game. Uh, and that that gave me entry into the uh, the, the night game uh, back then. The prize. So you didn't even win a prize. No nah, prize money was shocking. <laughs> so you prize won money. the tournament and didn't even win a prize. I know. <laughs> well, at the, then I thought it was a prize. I thought, wow, entry into this nighttime game. And there was some prize money in the nighttime game, not not a lot. But uh, uh, And another another time I, I came second, um, heads up to a, a, a pretty decent player. He still plays now. And uh, and I got a bottle of wine and it, and it wasn't a very good bottle of wine and I don't <laughs> drink much wine anyway. Uh, although, so uh, you really uh, love the game. You're, you're not, playing for, <laughs> not playing for many monetary rewards here. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's that's probably the the point that comes through from it. Uh, as long as I could play, I was, yeah, I'm I'm down with that. That's that's great. So, when did you when did you start playing online? At what point did uh, you go from those games to the online games? Well, I, I took quite. I took a few years because um, because I wasn't playing it that constantly, and and I didn't really. I think it might have been about 2009. Um, I finally came across Full Tilt, um, probably Full Tilt, I think, and PokerStars at the same time. And I only, um, because, you know, I wasn't strapped, with, wasn't strapped with cash, so I didn't want to lose my money on some online dodgy thing. Uh, so I was playing with Play Money for probably over a year or two um, just because it was... Yeah, to me, I thought, well, I can still get to play the game. How do you uh, feel about that decision to just play with play money? Oh. <laughs> How does oh. it make you feel? Now that I, I've heard what the, the online situation was like back then, I am so – I'm nearly gutted. I mean, I, there's not many things I, – I don't know that there's anything I, I can regret in my life. You know, whatever I've done, I've done. This one comes close to being – yeah, when I think – when I. I hear of people buying houses and, you know, it's just setting themselves up for life during that period of time. So. To say, you know, that is true for some people, but I will say that for the majority of folks, like human beings have a tendency to kind of create a narrative around why they're struggling in the present. And the narrative for me seems the, the narrative that I hear very commonly is like, oh, I struggle in these games today, but if I would have played 10 years ago, I'd be a millionaire. And to me, it's just like a mindset issue. It's just giving them an out and letting them off the hook because the reality is it was still hard 10 years ago. It wasn't just free money. People were not just punting off. I mean, people were punting off, but like there were no solvers. Strategy was way more primitive. And so the skill gap wasn't as ma- wasn't super massive even back then. So like to me it was a great time because the game was way bigger. Poker was legal in the United States. You could just take your money and make a deposit and get money on and that to me has been the biggest, you know, the biggest detriment to poker over the last 10 years is just the ability for anybody to put in their deposit card or their credit card and get money online. So I, I, I think you should definitely not feel regret and that people just kind of use that because I was around, you know, I was there 
And I know people were still struggling. It wasn't just free money straight away across the board. It was still tough. You know, you're still, you're still, it's still a cutthroat environment. Mm. Yeah, that's probably a really good point. And also, as, as you said, the, the training materials weren't the same back then. So I'm, I'm using this mindset now that, oh, if I had you know, what I've got now, I'd have all this uh, training materials. I would have studied, I would have given up whatever I was doing and just studied 24-7. There probably wasn't the amount of training materials to be studying 24-7. No. If, if I could go back a week, I mean... I would be a multimillionaire because I know the lottery numbers, but like <laughs> that information was not, is not available to me today. What the lottery will be in one week. Right. So like, yeah. can't, can't really use the same thing as far as poker strategy either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a, uh, I'm glad you've made me feel better about that. Uh, potentially having a regret. Uh, there's not, <laughs> like I say, there's not many things I can regret. It's, it's life is what it is. And, and everything that you do becomes part of your, your history or, or if you break down the word history, his story. Uh, there, that's, that's his story. It doesn't change. As a matter of fact, mo- most of the things that in the moment I've thought were devastating have given the benefit of knowing what would happen in the future have always turned into massive, massive positive situations for me. And I think that yeah. lots, of, lots of people kind of feel the same way when they have, you know, when they zoom out and they're not just in that specific moment, they kind of realize that like, okay, like maybe this was what I needed in that moment to become the person that I needed to be in the future. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's so totally right. And that's, to me, that's, that's why it's important not to get attached to anything right here in the now. Um, things are going to change. They may change in a way that you, you don't like at the moment. But in hindsight, you know, you can look back. I always think of the relationship breakups and, you know, if the girl's unhappy and she wants him back and she wants him back and it's like, this guy's no good for you. You know, you, you, you want him back now, but in five years' time or 10 years' time when you're happily married with kids, you're going to be so glad that, that you got rid of that douchebag. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> or that he got rid of you even. <laughs> right. Emotions, emotions are very powerful things and can obviously cloud the judgment of human beings in a lot of situations. Um, let's go back to poker. So when did, when did you make a, an actual deposit? I have here in the research that you were tracking your results via spreadsheet. I'm assuming that wasn't when you were playing play money. Mm, mm, true. Uh, the spreadsheets came about, uh, I don't know. I can't remember exactly how long ago, but it might have been six months before um, Black Friday. I was I was getting my spreadsheets. I was getting my act together so much. I'd, I'd made up these spreadsheets full of uh, you know the timings of every single tournament that was on over the next twenty four hours, or that would be on. So you know you had the weekly. Every Tuesday there'd be the same event. Every Wednesday there'd be the same event. So I I got all the times down because. These were on in most of the, the decent tournaments anyway, were on at weird times of the day for us because we're in Australia. So some of these had started, you know, I think the Sunday million usually starts, or I don't know if it still starts that time, but usually it's about six or seven Sunday, Monday morning usually starts. And if you want to play that thing, you're playing through Monday, the whole day into the night. And uh, yeah, so I had this uh, spreadsheet all worked out with the, uh, Every tournament from every site that I was possibly linked on, I, I think I had three accounts at the time, um, not a lot of money on each, but I was going to make sure that I had enough for these uh, tournaments, plus listed all the, the buy-ins, whether it was a rebuy, an add-on, the starting stack, the blind structure, uh, even prize money, late reg times. Uh, yeah, there's probably a couple of other things I put in there as well. And this spreadsheet, man, was looking so good. I was so looking forward to going, right, now if I, so if, with all the late rego times, if I bust out of these, I, I'll jump into this one and I'll jump into that one. Yeah, damn. And then Black Friday happened and uh, that, was, that was pretty much it for my spreadsheet. It, it took me a long time to, to build up the confidence to put money onto an, an online site that was based somewhere else in the world you know, and trust that I'd be able to get my money back if I did win. And, uh, yeah, that pretty much got sapped away at that time. 
And to be honest, it's taken a long time to get back. I still hesitate when it comes to putting money on on poker apps uh, or, or well, that's my about. yeah my my advice is pretty much always the same across the board. It's if if you are a professional specifically, you must take chances. You must take riskier chances that have the potential to pay off with a big reward, which can mean putting your money on some shady sites sometimes and taking a risk where you may lose your deposit. But the upside is you can find a great app where you get paid and find a place to put in a lot of volume and make a lot of money. And if the downside is just losing one deposit, it seems like a worthy gamble to me. For recreational players, my advice is just make a small deposit. And you don't have to trust the system, but if you make a small deposit and you realize, okay, it might disappear, I've burnt money doing dumber things in my life, I want to do this, why why am I going to deprive myself of a hobby that I enjoy because I'm afraid of losing $100 or $200 and the off chance that something horrible happens? Again, I think it's, it's small risk with a pretty, pretty nice reward. Mm, mm. Yeah, true. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'd probably, I mean, with our options being limited here in Australia, it's, it's really put me off seeing two guys in the same poker room when we when we were playing a live game uh basically just talking about well what's the next move and then it was like those two guys their two heads together weren't enough for this one guy that was playing uh that the third guy had to come in and give his advice on should this guy you know should he three bet or should he should he fold and i'm like man if that's happening here in this random poker room and, and i'm i'm viewing this here how many guys are in each other's lounge room just playing together? And it's true, but you know what? Yeah. You know what, Merv? Those guys don't scare me. Yeah, yeah. The, the guy sitting yeah. in the corner that doesn't ask anybody's opinion, that's in his own world, just mashing people's faces in. That's the dude. That's a formidable <laughs> opponent. Not the guy who's asking random humans about how they would play poker hand. That dude does not scare me. One iota. <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess me seeing these three guys and thinking that they're probably all better players than me. <laughs> and there's three three heads that are better than mine all working together, conspiring against me in this hand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think that's the way it works. I think that like the higher skill level you get, the less likely you are to ask outside opinion because like, I show up at any yeah. poker table in the world. I'm not going to ask some random human's opinion on how to play a hand. Like, because quite frankly, I think I'm better than 99.99% of the players that I'm going to encounter in the wild. Right. Like then the, the other 0.001 players that I think are better than me. Well, I've still got way too much pride and ego to ask their opinion. I'm damn sure not going to, going to be like, Hey man, I think you're better than me. You, you want to help me out of here? Regardless of like the, you know, the moral implications, just the, the e- ego implications are like, no <laughs> way. I'm never, never doing that. Which like kind of reminds me of like the, the whole Alex Fox and Kristen Bicknell thing that like people yeah. are talking about, which is like, it's so absurd to me that anybody would say Kristen would let Foxen help her at a Mm. final table when she is an elite player. She's in the top 10 um, GPI tournament players in the world right now. Players, poker players live to play big multi-table tournament final tables. This is the fruit of their labor to suggest she's going to make it there and let somebody else influence her decisions or make decisions for her is so beyond absurd that like Mm. it's almost a it's like a non-starter for a conversation yeah yeah totally Uh, it's interesting you bring up uh, Kristen Bicknell just going to what you said about uh, not asking players that are better than yourself how to play and uh, it was something I've been thinking of um, probably for the last week actually just thinking of how when you do enlist the help of players, maybe this this probably applies more to the recreational player side of it. Uh, 
where I come from. So, but when you do engage with players that are better than yourself, I think that can be a very fast way to learn more. Oh, um, and it Kristen is. mentioned it in that. That's what. That's why it's interesting you bring up uh, Kristen and Alex because, yeah, when when she said that, it really just rang true. That for, I've seen rec players. Yeah, I've seen like like so. Kristen's been on the podcast. She's super awesome. Alex gonna yeah. Alex is gonna come on the podcast at some point too. Super awesome dude. And like I told you before, I'm writing this newsletter and I'm I've been thinking of like more. Uh, how do we phrase this? Catchy headlines. We'll call them catchy. <laughs> like Phil Galfon's the most selfish man in poker, right? Because he doesn't promote run at once poker enough in enough. my <laughs> enough enough in my opinion. So that makes him selfish. And another headline that I can I can say this now because it's not going to be misinterpreted based on what I just said about uh, Kristen and Alex. But another headline was Alex Foxen one hundred percent helped Kristen Bicknell win her third WSOP bracelet. And the body of that is, of course he did. And of course she helps him win tournaments. They're partners. They discuss strategy. They live with each other. They grow with one another. Like iron sharpens iron. And if you are of the mind that being in close proximity to an elite poker player will have no effect on your game, you're out of your mind. Like you're just, Mm. you're out of your mind. So like, like did Foxen help her? Yes. Not, not actively, but passively and just becoming a better player in the same way that she has helped him actively become a better player too. Like they, they both work together, you know, like it's, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And this is just a great example. It's a, it's a story that, I've seen repeat over and over and over again. I got started in my career with a great player. He pushed me. I pushed him. We, you know, it was one plus one equals five. Fedor got involved. 10 German kids playing poker in the same house Mm. within a year. All 10 of them are in the top 100. Did they just Mm. randomly stumble upon the 10 of the top 100 players in the world? No, (laughs) they helped each other grow on a daily basis because proximity equals influence the people who you are in closest proximity with are going to influence you the most yeah yes which uh actually reminds me of my story and thinking how if i'm just playing a pub game once a week for four or five years am i going to get much better at the game Mm. (laughs) (laughs) probably not (laughs) (laughs) exactly that's pretty much uh, pretty much what happened i mean i think for quite a while there i didn't even i don't even know if i knew the existence of cash poker um Mm -hmm. you know to me it was just all tourneys and uh, as even while i was playing live tourneys didn't even know there was online tourneys so and so having these four different types of poker that uh, you know and i think that came up sort of later on until a few years ago really when i i realized that a lot of the information that i was listening to either was mostly coming from a, a cash perspective or it was mostly coming from an online perspective and and here i am playing live tourneys at pubs for low stakes, no wonder my mind was just, you know, I'd I'd get these techniques and, and these uh, uh, sort of things I'd want to try out and I never got the opportunity to. So, um, well, it's, this comes from like me studying poker, just me studying poker to learn how to teach poker because it is a very complex thing to teach and it's very, very hard to structure it in a way that is impactful in people's learning. And one-to-one coaching, just over the last few years, me helping students on a one-to-one level, I found has just been incredibly beneficial for them to get direct feedback on what they're doing, what their thought processes are, the problems that they're facing in the moment, and then have solutions tailored specifically for them in the games that they're playing in against the opponents that they're battling against. The problem with a lot of poker training is it's just so general. It's generalized Mm -hmm. generalized wisdom based on the game that these players are playing in, which may not resemble your game at all. And also... Mm -hmm. When you look at poker, I, I think of poker like, like a car. There's many different parts. There's many different components. And if your car breaks down or your car is struggling, you don't just hire a mechanic to just 
fix every piece of your car, right? You hire them to fix one specific piece that is struggling. Poker is not just one game. It is like a hundred different mini games and each one of them is its own part that affects the whole. So in order to learn poker effectively, you have to take out the part that is most impactful, look at it, study it, learn it without, without wondering about turn check raise ranges and all of these things that are way down the line in the decision tree and then improve that area of your game, move linearly to the next area of your game, study that, learn that. And this is the only way that I found that can really be impactful for somebody who's wanting to learn the game is to study in this way. Because like I've, I compared it to, uh, it's like when you, when you start playing poker, you just jump into the deep end of a pool and you have no idea how to swim. And you're just trying to navigate a million different things. And the problem is you don't know you're drowning. Like you don't know that you're at the bottom of the pool because you think you're doing okay. You think you're just making decisions and like, oh, I kind of get this intuitively. I understand. And you don't know the mistakes that you're making. And then at some point, you just kind of make this assumption that like, oh, yeah, I I made, I'm swimming great. I'm basically Michael Phelps. And you're still stuck at the bottom of the pool. Like, what's going on here? Right. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. And the, uh, the one to one coaching, you know, it's kind of like a lifeguard. It's like somebody shows you, oh, no, this is, let me help you out. This is what you're doing, um, what you need to improve in order to, to navigate and, and play better. Mm, exactly. And I think that where I made a, um, a choice to, I, I had a, a couple of coaches. Uh, the first one I got was predominantly a cash player. And uh, it took me a little while to realize, I mean, it was still great. I still fixed a, a few leaks. Um, in my game and got to to see how a, a, a real you know, full-time pro handles a lot of hands. And, uh, but yes, then, then I came across Carlos Welsh, the mediocre poker coach for mediocre players. And uh, man, this, if that's not great marketing. <laughs> I, love I love Carlos. He Carlos is awesome. Me and Carlos just did a, just released a round two interview. I wrote a newsletter about, Carlos and him not liking to interact with strangers because they're weird. Um, he's a great dude. He's the yeah. best, the best MTT value I would say for coaching that exists in the poker world right now. I feel sorry for his students because I basically begged him to charge more money for his coaching <laughs> than, than his $50 an hour. But, uh, yeah. He's just, he's an awesome dude. Ah, uh, but I, I was lucky enough um, to meet him out. One of the things I did uh, when I was starting, I was starting to get a bit uh, more serious about the game, 2014, 15, joined uh, a coaching group uh, specifically for tournaments, Tournament Poker Edge, TPE, uh, and uh, went, I, I was finding this was great. It was information specifically for tournaments. This is, this is what, I, what I want. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> I know, what an idea. Uh, and, yeah, I was uh, lucky enough I... I um, was my 50th birthday. I took myself off to, well, with my wife, off to Vegas um, amongst other places, Hawaii as well, but mostly Vegas for me. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I was able to play the seniors event in WSOP, uh, which was probably about uh, 10 times my previous high, highest buy-in, but it was just the experience that I wanted to go for. And, uh, Love the love the the humble brag of Hawaii in there, just right in the middle. By the way, that's <laughs> adds nothing to the story, but just wanted to <laughs> just let everybody know. Yeah, we went to Hawaii too. No big deal. You've heard me talk early and often about how improving your awareness while you're playing cards, so that you make better decisions in the moment and notice trouble spots that merit deeper consideration is one of the most valuable things you can do to make more money on the felt. In my conversation with the only four-time WPT main event champion ever, Darren Elias, he told me that his ability to shut out all of the distractions in the world and fully focus on making great decision after great decision is his superpower he most attributes to his success. And you cannot improve your awareness at the tables without being fully present. 
When you learn how to stay fully in the moment on the green felt, you can finally have a clear path to becoming the absolute best version of yourself, which leads me to Jason Sue. Jason is one of the foremost authorities on the planet when it comes to playing poker with presence. As a matter of fact, he even wrote the book on it. Here's a direct quote from Nick Howard at Poker Detox on Jason's ability to help you stay focused. Quote, Jason's work is a new paradigm in poker and performance. End quote. And these aren't just empty words. Nick has put his money where his mouth is by hiring Jason to coach up the Poker Detox crew. And as a loyal listener of Chasing Poker Greatness, you know by now that I would not be promoting anything I didn't 100% believe would improve your poker skills and your life. So if you want to master your emotions and perform at your peak with presence while doing battle in the arena, you'd be doing yourself a grave disservice if you didn't check out Jason's work at PokerWithPresence.com. One final time, that's PokerWithPresence.com. How'd you like the seniors event though, for real? Oh, it it was great. My, uh, My thoughts were like, this is great because here's a tournament I can play where all the young guys, young kids aren't younger than me that are better than me cannot play in this game. So, so I was figuring the pool, I must be, I must be so much higher up the, the ladder on, on this pool. And uh, yeah, I, I made it through, uh, I won't say through most of the night, but uh, it, was, it was still a good experience. Even as short-lived as it was, it did not last for more than one day. I did not experience bagging a cash at my first Vegas game, but uh, the seniors event was something I, I'll recommend it to anyone that hasn't gone to Vegas that plays poker. By the time you're 50, get there, go play the seniors <laughs> event, <laughs> at least to do, do something like that once. I, uh, I don't know <laughs> what percentage of my audience is 50 years old plus, but I would say it's a low percentage. <laughs> Come on. The same, uh, <laughs> maybe the same percentage as women. I think women looking at my, my, Data and demographics are like 3% of the, uh, the overall gender that listens to the podcast. Yes, yes. So uh, that's, um, that's, that's, probably, that's a whole other uh, story in poker, isn't it? The women in poker. Why don't we get more women playing poker? Well, maybe if people would stop being dicks to them uh, at the table and just treating them like little girls, um, gave them a bit more respect, then we might have a few more females at the table, but uh, yeah, it's it just, just astounds me seeing it. Sorry. It's yeah. Just one of my, see, I don't know. Again, I, I've, I've had this image too. this like narrative of women being treated very poorly in poker, but I've interviewed quite a few on this podcast who have said that their career has been for the most part, overwhelmingly positive with the mm. exception of obviously a few few maybe really, really poor events um, or interactions with human beings. But I will say that no matter what your sex is, if you're in poker long enough, you're going to have negative interactions with specific human beings that you play against. Um, so it's made me really question that narrative and ask myself if maybe maybe this isn't true and maybe there's some other things that are kind of coming into play because online poker, uh, you know, online poker is not live poker and you can just mute the chat, but it still doesn't seem like there's a massive influx of females in those fields either. Mm, Exactly. There's much more to it than that. Uh, I read something that was, could be called along the sexist lines, but uh, if women do most of the rearing of children, uh, which is probably still the case nowadays. Men do a lot more than they used to do, but well, yeah, um, <laughs> they they used to did not do very much at all. So let's. Uh, <laughs> that's very, what I mean. Very very short. It's improved. Bar, short bar <laughs> to, to jump over. So yeah, that that's um, yeah. There, there's just one reason there. They they can't spend uh, five or six hours or eight hours of late rego, yeah, you know, playing a tournament for twelve hours. Uh, I do think I, I do think the next, if there is a next golden age of poker when the U.S. gets their shit together and legalizes or does whatever they do, like the opportunity is in females because 
why are they just on the bench here? Like why, why have poker operators and platforms and tournament organizers? Like how do we get more women in the game? Because it's a beautiful game and it's clear that women can obviously hang with the men given Kristen Bicknell, um, you know, all just really Vanessa Selps, just tons of amazing, amazing females that have risen to the top. Like imagine if, you know, imagine if the ratio of men to women was like 75, 25, I mean, you know, 50% of the top tournament players in the world would likely be female. Like let's, let's be real here. The superstars in grade school and high school that were making all the A's and performing at a high level in my experience were were not the boys. (laughs) It was Mm -hmm. not the males. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's a, uh, such an under underrepresented part of our uh, community. Yeah, I, I look forward to that. Maybe it will take a, uh, a female winning the main event, like the moneymaker effect, and we might get a bit of a, a rush on there. Uh, Maybe yeah. we'll see. I don't know. Um, I hope I hope it gets better, but yeah. I, ho- I hope lots of things that don't actually happen. <laughs> but this is one that I really, really hope happens. Um, <laughs> So 2015, you, you play the seniors. You went to mm. the WSOP. From there, a few years later, you started your pod poker podcasting career. How did that come about? Uh, yeah, that was probably maybe not so much a joke, but uh, I, I was listening to some podcasts at the time, and um, one of them had a, an English host and an, an English and uh, and two Aussies on. And that was a little bit different because all the podcasts I was listening to mostly were American, um, a couple of uh, non-American podcasts, but mostly that. And yeah, I, I heard them say at the end of, or actually it was, I think it was at the start of one of the episodes was, oh, well, we've lost one of our hosts. Uh, we need someone to steer the ship. And I thought, oh, he's just joking. And then at the end of the show, he repeated, they <laughs> repeated the request. Oh, okay, they're, they're not joking. And I thought... Yeah, I've always been told I've I've got a good face for radio, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I could give this a try. And um, yeah, wrote into them, told them that I had because uh, he was talking about we need someone to to captain the ship. And I said, look, I had experience at school in my football team. I was captain of the thirteen E's. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, they they said, yeah, let's give it a go. And um, yeah, from been going from that point on. So probably nearly three years now, I think, uh, roughly every fortnight, um, episode, we say fortnightly ish. Uh, That's every two weeks for the American audience that doesn't know what a fortnight is besides a video game. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize it wasn't a universal term uh, until just then. <laughs> Shockingly, it's not. <laughs> and also, as you found in the podcasting world, podcasters never joke. So oh. <laughs> that advertisement, not a joke, deadly serious. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, um, that was what, it. I, I had, yeah. What's the experience been like? Oh, absolutely so. awesome. Absolutely awesome. From, from day one, uh, even though I was probably, I was, I was probably a bit nervous. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to go back and listen to some of those earlier ones <laughs> because, uh, uh, yeah, the voice was probably a bit shaky, and but yeah, just the experience. I mean, I one of the things I said to to Ben, um, my co-host, uh, was that I had a list of players that I had communicated with on Twitter, um, and some of them had met at uh, either at the TPE meetup in Vegas, uh, two thousand fifteen, uh, and a few other associates from that. Um, that I would like to get on the show as as guests, and yeah, being able to do that, we um, so there's a little bit of background. The post flop poker podcast uh, uh, Ben started it because he'd written a book called Post Flop, and it had about twenty seven chapters in. And uh, I, the time that I joined, um, they were just about near the end of all the chapters, not knowing what do we do with the show from here? We've run out, <laughs> we've done an episode on each of the chapters. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, t- nearly totally selfishly, I suggested, well, why don't we have some guests on 
uh, because they'd, they'd had a few guests before, actually some quite decently well-known guests. So, you know, Jonathan Little, Greg Raymer, uh, yeah, and the list goes on. But they had some pretty decent guests beforehand, but I, I wanted to continue that. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I gave him this list and, of people that I thought I'd love to speak to and uh, I've been slowly ticking them off <laughs> one by one over the over the few years and, yeah, just totally awesome. Uh, that all kind of led to in well, 2017. Let me, before we move forward, let me put you on the spot here. Which of the conversations uh, pops into mind immediately is especially memorable? There, there's quite a few. Um, the one... And it does change over time. Uh, if you asked me this question six months ago, it might have had a different answer. Just I think because of the different guests that I have on, each new, newer one can become favourites. I'm going to say Sarah Herring uh, pops into to mind. Um, just her, her work ethic, her um, approach to life ethic um, in that just being able to be around people without so much judgment. Um, she's had to cover stories uh, on people that have just been so put down and whether she agrees with them or not, she still tries to put the story across in a, um, a non, non-biased way. It's a lot harder when you know someone and like someone. Also the, the bust out stories and that she's had to go and interview players after they bust out from a tournament uh, the worst time to have to talk to a poker player just after you bust out of a tournament, especially when they're so close to the to the win, the way that she she handles all of those, let alone the fact that she's been running you know, the, the Poker News podcast uh, family, a group of podcasts and reporters and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then she goes and has a, has a child and says, yeah, okay, and I'll still keep doing this job. You know, a lot of respect for her. Uh, it was, plus it was probably one of the the funnier ones. We, I've, I've always had this thing that uh, I think that poker would be a great vehicle to raise money for all different uh, causes, local and, and international. And, uh, yeah, we got to talking on, on, on the pod about how we could have an invitational charity match uh, named after my grandmother. Um, that's uh, <laughs> Sarah's idea. And, um, yeah, just with some of the, the best players around and a, a couple's invitational charity tournament. So you, you had the Galfons and <laughs> uh, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, just just really lovely. And I think actually all the guests that we've had on, it's just been great to chat to them as real people. And to find out that despite this person's sort of um, position in the poker echelon, they're just real people, you know, and just so good to talk to. And, and I've always had an interest in people and, and you know, what, what, in, what interests people is what interests me at the time. And I, I find that um, I'd much rather find the, the similarities that you have with someone than the differences. It, it's so easy to find the differences that, that you've got with someone else. And people make make that the big thing. But when we find the similarities that we have with people, what you've got in common with them, there's a, it's like a, an instant bond. And, um, yeah, I, that's something I just I get off on that I, every day. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it as well. And Auntie Chardonnay is one of, my, one of my favorite guests. Just, you know, she's a great person. Sarah Sarah's a great person, a great storyteller. You just reminded me that I need to have her back on the show for round two. It's been seven or eight months and a couple of things have changed in the world. Uh, very minor, minor world changes since our first conversation, including her having a kid and, you know, the, basically the, the whole world um, being on flames. Even in Australia, it actually was on flames. Which it's about to be again. <laughs> people don't even, it, it's like not even a story in the U.S. now. Like it's something that, you know, that was like the major news story. And then yeah. COVID happened and it was like every, like it, it, there was a lot of things that kind of happened back to back to back. But anyway, don't want to get bogged mm. down on that, but I get what you're saying. 
I love the guests as well. It's great learning just about human beings and how they think. And, you know, you're pretty spot on about Sarah, non-judgmental human, tries to find the good in people and likes finding mm. common, common ground rather than just, you know, divisive and polarizing. And I think that there's a lot of folks in the world that think in binary terms where Merv, you disagree with me on one thing that I'm passionate about. You're a shithead and I Mm. hate you and everything Mm. that you think is wrong and you're dumb. And that's just, it's a crappy way that humanity as a society is seeing each other. You know, we're human beings. Like I can't imagine just going through life and needing every single person to agree with everything that I thought all of my opinions and all of my perspectives. I mean, you're just, you're so fragile and Mm. it's not, it's not, it's not a way to live. I I don't think it's a really a great way to treat people either. No, no. And I think the, uh, the political system of democracy is possibly responsible for it in a way, Uh, especially a two party system. You have two choices. You either vote for this one or you vote for that one. And then you're going to, you have to end up with at election time, people forming sides and uh it's so divisive and uh yeah there's there should be a lot more that we can get together on and on common ground there's a lot of problems we want to fix hospitals schools you know these things need need fixing and they need fixing on bipartisan level uh well it's just it's relationships and human beings i mean i believe yeah. i have a totally different belief system than 98 percent of my family but they love me unconditionally. They call me when other people do not. They check in on me. They raised me. They spent their energy providing me with all the things that I needed and giving me love and teaching me games and laughing and having fun. And to say that none of that matters because we believe things different politically or we have mm. different religious beliefs, it's a shame. It, mm. It's, it's mm. really quite a shame. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's probably one of the biggest things in, in society. I think that, uh, I I will look forward to seeing shift and change, uh, as, as we hit this 21st century, I, I, I remember thinking that around about in the 1985, 1990, that when we hit 2000, everything's going to change. You know, the whole world's just going to come together and we'll have the Olympics in Sydney, uh, share the spirit, you know, it's all, it's all happening. Uh, yeah, it didn't happen. 20 years <laughs> later, we're learning that the Olympics is a scam. They mistreat their athletes. <laughs> they take tons of money from every economy that they have their games and give nothing back. And the world is probably more divided than it ever has been. Mm which can only serve as a catalyst to actually get it back together again is, uh, is my takeaway from it. Yeah, there you go. Always, um, always on the, <laughs> the positive side of the fence. I did have something that I wanted to say that I, I believe passionately in, and it's because of this binary nature and divisive nature of politics and beliefs where if you have one belief that is different than somebody else, people will crush you. It becomes a situation where a lot of times on Twitter, maybe I disagree with the common narrative. And I think to myself, should I tweet this? Should I put my head out there? Will I get crushed by folks in the poker world? And routinely, I find myself forcing my fingers to send the tweets to disagree. If it's something of a, of a small nature, that's very, you know, it's low risk. It's a low risk disagreement because for everybody out there listening, don't be afraid of low risk disagreements because when you need to disagree with something that is important, that's pivotal, when you need to stand up and do the right thing in the face of a bunch of people doing the wrong thing, if you don't take those small steps by disagreeing with low risk, when it's high risk, you never will because you're not mm. conditioned and it's just too much. So like make yourself uncomfortable, listener. Disagree with people 
in a loving way and feel that uncomfortability because, you know, now I, I was going to take us to somewhere that, that is a hard place to get back from once I go there. But when, when, when something's going down, that is clearly not correct. You want to have the willpower to stand up and say, this is not right. Take action. Mm. So take those yeah. small steps. I think, I think the, uh, the piece that hit me the most there is uh, disagreeing in a loving way yeah. is the key there. Uh, it, yeah, you're not going to get anywhere. And you, to me, if you do things in, in a loving way, anything in a loving way, there may be small repercussions that come to you because of that uh, particular action. But if you're doing it in a loving way, basically... You, you can't fault yourself for your actions um, if you do something in a loving way. Uh, others may, and they may judge you for that. They may disagree with it, blah, blah, blah. But um, really, as far as measuring yourself against it, and, and this is probably where the inaction can, you can hate yourself if you don't make that action that you really feel called to do, it can start to eat away. I need to say, you know, I need to say something about this. I, I really need to get this off my chest because I feel this strongly about it. And uh, yeah, it's the way that you you approach it. And uh, I, I think that's sometimes where humor can come in as well. Uh, if you say something in a humorous way, but this is also where Twitter can, uh, can be a little bit dangerous is because sarcasm isn't always well, well uh, read. Sure as well as fact checking isn't always a case uh, before someone goes off there in that. Well, um, to the people that, that go ballistic, right. And you see, you, you kind of see it over and over and over again. And imagine that you're on the left, right? How influenced are you by president Trump? Probably not very influenced. And if you're on the right, how influenced are you by Nancy Pelosi? by Hillary Clinton, by Joe Biden, probably not very much. When you attack people, it does not make them more likely to come to your side and believe the thing that you believe because mm. they do not respect you. It makes them dig in to their side of the argument. Strategically, it is a horrible, horrible move. And yet I see poker players making the same strategic mistake when they try to influence people by calling them stupid and calling them selfish. And that is just not a good way to go about meeting your goal. If your goal is to influence others to change the way that they think so that the world's a better place. Mm. Yeah. At the, at the poker, at the poker table, when, uh, when the good player admonishes the bad player for making a bad move, I, I just think, why don't you just, Keep, keep quiet, let the guy play the way that he wants to play. <laughs> we'll all learn from it and uh, we won't discourage them from uh, making that same mistake again or, or even wanting to come and play again. You know, if, if, if someone plays a hand really poorly that, and they, they beat me, I'll just tap the table and say, you know, nice hand. Um, that gives me something to learn from. Yeah, just rather than having the, the ego of, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have called me with third, third pair or bottom pair. You, you know, you should have known I could have had aces. I could have had Kings. I, I could have had everything, but that player doesn't know that. <laughs> you no, do. and it, it's in your head. <laughs> you think you do, yeah. but you probably yeah. don't even, um, yeah. because most of the players that do play at a high level, never do that sort of thing in poker. As a matter of fact, I'll just go out and sit, make a controversial statement that any player who acts like that when somebody misplays a hand is not a winning player. Quite frankly, yeah. if that's something you do, you're a losing poker player and you need to look in the mirror and have a talk with yourself because the longer you act like that, the longer you're going to be a losing poker player. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Um, Merv, let's, uh, let's do a little, little lightning round, wrap it up. Wrap it up so you can go have your breakfast and go about your day on the beach. Right. This will, this will be a challenge. I'm not real good at doing many things quick. So <laughs> <laughs> my wife might agree with that. <laughs> um, if you could gift all poker players one book, what would it be and why? 
Well, it's okay. I'm going to say, I'm going to say Tommy Angelo's Painless Poker. It's got a little bit of a fictiony feel to it. Uh, so it, it satisfies people that want to be reading more of a, a fiction story rather than nonfiction. Uh, it's also has to do with every single time that you lose a hand in poker, you can relate to the pain of poker. Um, of course, we all, we want to win every single hand. You can't win every single hand. When you lose a hand, you've got to get over that, that, you know, a little feeling of pain that happens. Well, there. Uh, one of my one of my favorite quotes is from a character in White Men Can't Jump. Her name's Gloria, and she tells Woody Harrelson that sometimes when you win, you really lose. Sometimes when you lose, you really win, and sometimes when you tie, you really win or lose. And <laughs> <laughs> that has always stuck with me, and is so true in poker that you can win a hand and really lose it. And you can lose a hand and really win it. And that's just the reality. Yeah, totally. Yep, that's it's, it's how you think of it. Yeah. You could lose a hand and then that puts you at such a blind uh, level that you actually play differently for the rest of the game and you pick up your game a bit. Well, and, it, uh, it's not just that. It's that I've looked at poker my whole career as playing into the infinity. And... I'm going to play hundreds of thousands of different iterations. And if I can lose the minimum when I get set over set, or I can lose the minimum when I have kings versus aces pre, and I bust my opponent every single time, then I've won that confrontation. So even if I lose a pot and lose the minimum in a spot where I know they're going broke, I look at that as a victory because we're playing the infinite game. Everything's reciprocal at the end of the day. And so you just make the best decisions you can and you're kind of competing against these future spots that are going to be reversed. And if you look at Booker that way, then it's easy to, you know, it's easy to feel excited that like, sweet, like I, I lost the minimum. I saved my stack. They're not going to. And when the situation's reversed, I bust them and I get the money. Hmm. Exactly. Nice, <laughs> nice way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> if you could erect a billboard, every, every poker player has got to drive past on the way to the card room, what does it say? This might sound a little bit, uh, uh, not sure what the word for it is, but um, <laughs> basically I'm going to say be nice to people. It's also probably broad enough so that non-poker players will see it as well <laughs> and be able to approach it. Uh, but I basically mean that. Just just make the game a bit more enjoyable. Don't, you know, be nice to dealers, the, the, the people that are, are there they're getting paid to to uh, deal deal this great game of cards to you. Uh, they're probably not getting paid a huge amount. Just be nice to them. The players, you know, make the experience nicer for everyone. Make people want to come back time and time and time again after, um, as opposed to people when you have the experience of people being nasty at the poker tables. It affects not just the table that they're on, but the other tables around. Um, and yeah, just. People won't want to come back in general. So, yeah, be nice to people. Being nice to people is the best way to grow the game and it's the best Mm. way to be an influence and be somebody that's respected in your community. Nice. Merv, what's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? Uh, It's another good question. It's probably... uh, so a lot of detail to go into with this, but so we won't go too far down it. But uh, <laughs> let's just say I'm uh, putting together a Zoom room for probably 30, 40 people that will have a four or 500 people visit over a few days periods, getting them all together, welcoming them in, into the room, uh, making sure they all have a, a, a top experience. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, effort going into the the planning of it but when it comes out and uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough as we're up to the third iteration um it's just running so smoothly uh, i'm so sort of glad of it um yeah that's it's awesome basically organizing a lot of people to have a really fun time <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a fun project for sure yeah, definitely. um final question 
where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the World Wide Web? Uh, interestingly enough, on the World Wide Web, not very many places. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I Googled myself a couple of years ago and I found uh, that uh, someone else that has my name, uh, Merv Harvey, not a very common name. Uh, you've got a, a cricketer from the 50s. You've got a, a horse trainer um, from five or ten years ago that had a, a link to a Melbourne Cup winner. Uh, <laughs> Or you may find this guy that's uh, he's on Twitter, Merv underscore Harvey. I'm not on Facebook or any other socials. I, I just feel I would spend so much time on those as well. Um, I already spend a bit too much time on Twitter, I'm told. And uh, and the Post Flop Poker Podcast, uh, where I get to host that with my co-host Ben Hales. And as I, as we talked about, have lots of really really interesting guests on. Uh, they're probably the two best places. Awesome, Murph. All, all, all that will be on the show notes, minus the cricketer and all the fake Murph Harveys. <laughs> I, I've told my wife before that one of my goals is just to be on the front page of Brad Wilson's in Google search. I still haven't gotten there. <laughs> Brad Wilson is a very common name, and there's some super high achieving Brad Wilsons that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make it yeah. make it tough making it there. But anyway. Yeah. It's it's a goal. It's a goal to have, and um, why not? I don't see. Uh, I can see it happening. Yeah, we got it, a chance. Uh, We're drawing live. We're drawing live, Merv. Yeah. As we say over here, uh, it may not happen overnight, but it will happen. <laughs> I think that I think that comes from a hair hair ad. So <laughs> don't quote me on that. <laughs> you can't see, but neither of us have any hair, so not exactly a uh, ringing endorsement, um, Merv. Thank you for your time and your energy. I love it. Need to have you. I, I've loved the conversation. Need to have you on the show again in the next year or two for around two. Take care, my friend. Uh, that's been awesome. Thank you so much, Brad. Been a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker and Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.